Hello and welcome to the nurse station. I'm Maria Mobley and this is heart failure part two. As always, these videos are for educational purposes only and I really hope they're helping. Um, just a reminder, part one was about the pathophys, signs and symptoms that you would see um, for a heart failure in terms of right-sided versus left-sided. And now we're gonna go into medication management, nursing interventions, and also patient education. So I have to stress, Heart failure comes in so many different classifications, severities. Um, the medication management I'm gonna talk about right now is uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but these clients are stable, okay? And of course, please, please understand, don't know your patient by the disease, know your patient. Their um, health history determines other medication management. For instance, do they have AFib and therefore would warrant arrhythmia management? Um, has their blood pressure been controlled with, uh, for instance, an ACE inhibitor in the past? So there's so many other things that come into medication management. But again, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we're gonna start with this gold standard. Um, and when I say we, the healthcare provider, based on evidence, and again, um, so important, it depends on how your client presents their symptoms, right? Because if they're severely hypotensive, I'm not putting them on an ACE inhibitor, right? But this is traditional management right here. An ACE inhibitor or an R plus a beta blocker. So let's go into more detail. I always tell my students, I don't want you to just memorize. I want you to understand the why so you retain it, so you remember it for the future. So let's talk a little bit about ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So this is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, and then you have your angiotensin II receptor blocker. So if we remember back to the RAS system, okay, um, angiotensin is one of the most powerful vasoconstrictors in the body, right? So let's, let's see. We got our blood vessel. This is our blood vessel. So we know if we have angiotensin in use in our body, it causes vasoconstriction. It causes narrowing of the vessels and therefore increases pressure. Well, look. This is blocking angiotensin in some way, right? So instead of narrowing blood vessels, it blocks angiotensin, again, a powerful vasoconstrictor and causes vasodilation. So let's think about that. It reduces the, the pressure within the vessels, right? That's why it drops blood pressure, but also think it increases blood flow and then hopefully, therefore, decreasing the workload of the heart. That's why it's beneficial for heart failure clients, okay? So they're not pre prescribed both. It's an ACE or an ARB. And let's talk about nursing things that we need to consider. First off, with heart failure clients, they can't get just any ACE inhibitor. They can't get any ARB. They can't get any beta blocker. It's very specific. It's based upon evidence. Um, for instance, enalapril is an appropriate ACE inhibitor. Uh, Lasartan is an appropriate ARB, right? So it's one, it says ACE inhibitor or ARB. So traditionally you start with your ACE inhibitor, right? And when you think about uh, medications in, in my professional practice, again, you can't memorize every sign and symptom, right? I always think about what is the riskiest complication associated with this drug therapy or what's the most life-threatening complication. I also think about what is the most common side effect that this patient can see so I can educate them about that? So with ACE inhibitors, of course, you think about the ACE cough, right? Um, we think about serious complications. We know ACE inhibitors drop blood pressure. So we're thinking about hypotension, orthostatic hypotension, right? Safety with movement, making sure they're not dizzy or faint. Um, and then a serious complication I always associate with ACE inhibitors is angioedema, right? Uh, rare but life-threatening. It's the painless swelling that can occur, especially in the face, the lips, the tongue. So traditionally, somebody started on an ARB if they can't tolerate an ACE. So again, let's say that persistent ACE cough is just bothering the patient so much. They can, if the healthcare provider deems it safe, switch them to an ARB, okay? So it's an ACE or ARB. So let's talk about our nursing interventions when we give these medications, of course we know it drops blood pressure. We just talked about why, right? It blocks in some way angiotensin, therefore stopping vasoconstriction and causing vasodilation, dropping the, the blood pressure, the pressure within the vessels. 
So of course we have to monitor their blood pressure, right? A contraindication of these drugs is hypotension. If their blood pressure is already low, you're not going to administer that drug. So monitor blood pressure. Do y'all remember what happens to potassium levels on these drugs? Traditionally, ACEs and ARBs cause hyperkalemia, so we'd need to monitor the potassium levels. And then, of course, kidney function. These drugs directly target the RAS system. We know RAS has, is very important when it comes to the kidney, right? If we think back to AMP. So BUN and creatinine levels, making sure that their kidney is functioning appropriately for these drugs. So let's drop down the beta blockers. And I kind of put kind of a short ending. ACE inhibitors traditionally end with PRIL. Right? I gave you the example, enalapril is appropriate for heart failure clients. ARBs traditionally, not all of them, but traditionally in an ARTIN. Um, I gave you the example of Losartan. You might have heard of uh, Valsartan. Those are all ARBs. And then we know our beta blockers traditionally end in LOL, right? Um, an example of an appropriate uh, beta blocker is Carbidolol, okay, for heart failure clients. So when we think about beta blockers, and I'm gonna tell you this, I clearly remember this in my nursing school. Um, I was in nursing school in 2004, and I clearly, clearly remember for heart failure clients, my teacher said, do not give beta blockers. And at that time, I can't remember, that might've been what was best practice based upon evidence. But let's think about this. I'm gonna draw my heart. Y'all know it's a horrible heart, right? A square. So, we got our right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And remember what happens with heart failure. Um, there's a reduced ability for your heart to pump effectively. So think, you have less blood from your left ventricle pushing out to the rest of your body through the aorta, right? Because you have reduced ability of the heart to pump effectively. So less blood being ejected from that left ventricle. And also, we also have backup. Right, so it can lead to pulmonary congestion. Um, it can lead to systemic, right, edema, and all those other things we can see when we we just have fluid volume overload. So let's think about this. We know a beta blocker decreases heart rate, right? So you're like, oh shoot, somebody with decreased cardiac output. Why would we ever want to decrease their heart rate? So let me first say this: if your client is unstable, if they are not perfusing, you really better consider, is this okay to give, right? You, you, you're not giving it to a hypotensive or a bradycardic client. That's not appropriate. But think about this. You got your stable client. If we slow down the heart and allow our ventricles to relax better and then feel better, hopefully over time, that beta blocker will actually increase perfusion because it's pumping, the left ventricle is functioning more effectively because it's relaxing and feeling better, therefore allowing more blood to be ejected from the left ventricle. So that's why it is based upon evidence. That's why it's appropriate to give beta blockers to certain, again, certain heart failure clients, right? I'm talking about a stable client. I'm not talking about, um, we'll, we'll get to complications in a second, but that's kind of the premise behind it. So think, beta blockers, again, slow down the heart, allow for the, for instance, left ventricle to feel better. So relax, feel better, and then hopefully in time, eject more effectively. That's why we give beta blockers to heart failure clients. So let's think about our nursing interventions. We know beta blockers slow the heart down. So we know we have to check a pulse, and it's not just any pulse, it's an apical pulse for a full minute. And traditionally, you hold a beta blocker for a heart rate in an adult client for less than 60, right? Of course, we also understand that beta blockers drop blood pressure. So a contraindication of this drug is hypotension. So you're monitoring for uh, low blood pressure, you're monitoring their blood pressure, you're looking out for orthostatic hypotension, all those things that we already talked about with your ACEs and your ARBs, and we need to monitor their heart rhythm as well. So traditionally, these clients are on some type of heart monitoring device, um, especially, and you'll learn in pharmacology, if you ever have to push these drugs IV, they have to be on a heart monitor, and you have to push it over a certain amount of time while monitoring their heart rhythm. So very important nursing interventions. 
Now, again, gold standard for your traditional heart failure client with reduced ejection fraction, um, ACE or R plus beta blocker. Now let's go into other things we'll see, right? I know when we get down to here, y'all cannot see heart failure without digoxin in those nursing textbooks. Trust me, I've read them. Dig is always right there with heart failure. But I do wanna just, um, in the real world, it's not prescribed, it's not appropriate for every heart failure client. But we're gonna talk about it because again, my lectures are geared towards that NCLEX perfect world. So let's start with diuretics. We know diuretics can be administered as needed for fluid volume overload, and we absolutely know heart failure clients are at risk for flu fluid volume overload. So um, furosemide is a very uh, traditional diuretic we can administer to heart failure clients in fluid volume overload. And notice I don't say Lasix. Y'all, I'm sure have been told by your instructors that the NCLEX test on generic. You can see a trade name, absolutely. I'm not saying you can't, but you should know your generic name. So I'm not saying Lasix, I'm saying furosemide as your diuretic. So what do we need to monitor with diuretic administration? I love to always pose this question to my students, and a lot of times it's a test question too. Um, I'll say a nurse is administering furosemide to um, a heart failure client. What assessment data would show the medication is working best or something like that? And I would have more assessment data. Let's say the client had crackles in their lungs, or let's say they had um, pitting edema. I would always put that symptom in there, and then I would always put urine output as well. And I kid you not, majority of the times, and I understand why. Students, we have to monitor urine output with diuretics. We know that. We know that diuretics increase the, the volume coming out of the body through urine, right? But y'all, we gotta critically think. Your urine output is going to increase. Can you, with a diuretic administration, okay? That's just a fact. Can you prove to me that they are actually getting better? Can you prove to me that their assessment is getting better based upon diuretic administration? It's not with urine output alone. The best indicator that a diuretic is working is the problem that we're using it for. So if they had crackles on their lungs, I wanna auscultate clear lung sounds. If they had weight gain, I wanna see a decrease in weight. If they had pitting edema, I wanna see edema reduced. That is the best indicator that a diuretic is working. So I hope you remember that because that's so important for your patients as well when you care for them. If I'm given a diuretic, I wanna make sure that it's working based upon assessment. What was my problem? What showed me fluid volume overload? And now I wanna see it improve, okay? So of course your nursing interventions, we know diuretics can decrease blood pressure, so we'd monitor blood pressure, monitor for orthostatic hypotension. You, of course, not need to monitor their urine output, not only monitor it, but make sure that they have access to bathroom facilities in a safe manner um, if they don't have a Foley catheter in. Um, of course, we don't want to give these drugs at nighttime, right? We don't want them peeing throughout the night. So unless they're critically ill and they have a Foley catheter in, but monitor the urine output, make sure they have access to bathroom facilities. Now, we talked about ACE and ARBs increase potassium. Diuretics decrease potassium. So you need to be monitoring for hypokalemia. Yes, we have our potassium sparing diuretics, but right now I'm talking about furosemide, a loop diuretic. We need to do daily weights. We need to auscultate lung sounds. If they had fluid on their lungs, you need to monitor. What if they had fluid um, in their respiratory, their uh, pulmonary system, and they were very short of breath. Um, you need to make sure that their breathing's improved. And then again, just a big, big reminder. Your most important assessment data when it comes to a diuretic to show improvement is to focus on what was showing you fluid volume overload in the first place. So again, if I had, a, if I had somebody in heart failure with crackles in their lungs, and I administer a diuretic, and I could only assess one thing, urine output or lung sounds, I'm gonna go for the lung sounds every time because that's the, a be that's the best indicator. That's showing improvement of the problem, okay? Now, let's get to DIG. Um, we know, again, in your nursing textbooks that DIG is always talked about with heart failure and very important interventions. You can kind of think DIG, um, I, not, of course, not, not similar mechanism and all that, but it does drop heart rate just like beta blockers. It does drop blood pressure just like a beta blocker. So of course, um, it can cause arrhythmias. 
like a beta blocker. So we need to be monitoring the apical pulse. Again, traditionally you hold it with an adult client if it's less than 60 beats per minute. You need to monitor their blood pressure because it drops it right? A contraindication can be hypotension. We need to be monitoring their heart rhythm because there's a risk of arrhythmias, especially when we talk about ditch toxicity. Um, so let's get into ditch toxicity. We know we have to monitor our ditch levels. So anytime it comes to monitoring levels, for instance, warfarin, when you're talking about anticoagulation, you need to know your therapeutic levels. For digoxin, it's 0 0.5 to 2. We'd monitor ditch levels, and of course, we're looking for signs and symptoms of ditch toxicity, which can be life-threatening. So a lot of people always jump straight to the changes in vision, right? The halos, greenish, yellow, uh, visual changes, or shadowing of objects. But don't forget nausea vomiting. A lot of times they have GI distress, heart rhythm changes, arrhythmias, um, and a uh, really big risk factor for all those things. Hypokalemia. So decreased potassium levels increases your risk of ditch toxicity. And look, if you ever see these two drugs together, you really better, in that, in that NCLEX style question, even in your real practice, really better be looking at your patient closely, making sure that their potassium levels are okay, making sure that they're not experiencing any signs of ditch toxicity. Because I can't tell you how many NCLEX style questions I've seen them pairing, for instance, furosemide with digoxin and what, what needs to be a concern or what should the nurse be monitoring. You need to be looking for those signs of ditch toxicity. You need to be monitoring for their potassium levels because we need to make sure that they're not low. Because again, we know hypokalemia increases the risk of ditch toxicity. So look for all these signs and symptoms in your clients and make sure that you are uh, monitoring their ditch levels. Okay, now let's jump to nursing interventions. All right, and again, my, my goal is not to help you memorize my board. My goal is to help you have a better understanding of the why so you remember it. And also, please don't ever forget to supplement your own instructor's notes, right? They're the ones testing you, so you need to take what they've given you and supplement this as well. So I'm gonna draw a horrible picture of a body like I always do. And let's, I, they always look like boobs, but this is your chest, that's your lungs, okay? So I did a square this time. So when we are looking at our patient, our nursing intervention should focus on our patient. And I always, always prioritize my assessment according to Maslow's, okay? So yes, airways first, traditionally, unless they're in, um, for instance, pulmonary edema, a, a life-threatening complication. Traditionally, with a stable heart failure client, their airways patent. But airway patency assessment is priority, right, according to Maslow's. But let's get into general respiratory assessment. Your patient has the risk of fluid volume overload. Think about how that affects the lungs, right? Think about how you should position them in bed. So I have the potential of fluid volume overload, especially in my pulmonary, my, my, just my respiratory assessment in general, right? What should you be doing? You need to be monitoring their oxygen saturation. Do they need oxygen as needed? Are they short of breath? In general, is it with exertion? Do they have accessory muscle use? Are you auscultating lung sounds? If you are, what are you hearing? Is there any signs of fluid volume overload such as crackles? right? That's all in respiratory assessment. You shouldn't be lying heart failure clients flat, right? But we know that it's, that it's a better ability to breathe while sitting up. We need them in Fowler's position. So all those considerations have to be um, thought about with your heart failure clients. Let's move into cardiac. Now, again, this is a structural disorder of the heart, right? Reduced ability to pump effectively. How is that gonna show cardiac wise? You are at risk for arrhythmias. And I say you, I'm talking about your patient. The patient's at risk for arrhythmias. They should have heart monitoring. All the medications we just talked about, right? They could be bradycardic. They could be hypotensive based upon medication administration. Reduced cardiac output, how does that look? If my left ventricle isn't pumping effectively to the rest of my body, won't I have lack of perfusion? Won't I maybe have um, decreased cap refill? Will I have uh, lack of perfusion to my kidneys or my liver? 
could I start seeing, for instance, my BUN and creatinine increase because my kidneys are not being perfused? Could I see decreased cardiac output um, leading to decreased urinary output, right? So when you're thinking about cardiac, which would be after my respiratory assessment according to Maslow's, again, cardiac monitoring, heart sounds, heart rate, blood pressure, hydration. They could be on diuretic medication administration. Are they hydrated? Are you checking um, skin turgor and looking at mucous membranes to make sure they are staying hydrated, okay? Also, I did put edema down here, but that definitely can be trumped up there with cardiac, right? Do they have edema? Do they have a weight gain? That's all related to your heart's ability to pump effectively or not. Now, daily weights, urine output in labs. With a heart failure client, you have to get daily weights. Um, a lot of times, again, for instance, with diuretic administration, we want to see them lose weight daily. So we're going to get down to this with patient education, but we need to be performing daily weights. When they're at home, you need to educate them on how to obtain a, a weight daily. Urine output, right? Are they getting the minimal that we need? We always need at least 30 mLs of urine per hour. If they have reduced cardiac output, you might not see that. If they're not perfusing, you might not see that. If they're on diuretic administration, you're gonna see increase in urine output. Your labs, again, decreased cardiac output. We might have decreased perfusion to organs, such as our kidneys and our liver. You need to look at labs, make sure that um, your liver function test or your BUN and creatinine when it comes to kidneys, they're not elevating. You're not showing signs of um, reduced function. So we do always encourage heart failure, heart failure clients to increase activity. Of course, this is based upon doctor's orders and that they're stable. Um, we try to cluster activity together so they don't get extremely tired and short of breath and overly exerted. So you try to cluster all the activity that needed they need to do at once to give them good periods of rest. And then preventing VTE. So we always have to prevent in inpatient hospitalized clients blood clots. The, we, it's called VTE prophylaxis in the hospital. So with your heart failure clients, of course, you have um, risk of blood clots just for them being admitted and not moving around as much as they usually would at home. Um, think about what you can have on them. You can have the TEDs and SCDs right on their legs to help um, push that, that stagnant blood or pulling blood back to the heart. You can have the heparin subcute injections if it's not contraindicated due to any other problems, right? We wouldn't give it to a bleeding client. So look for your VTU prophylaxis. And then again, they need to have bathroom accessibility, especially if they're on a diuretic, inspecting their skin and especially their dependent areas. I can't tell you how many times I've come, up, come on change of shift and I'm reported no edema to bilateral low extremities and I pull back those blankets and they have swelling in their calves, ankles, and feet. Please, please be checking for dependent edema and then monitor for complications. Heart failure, as I talked about in part one, can lead to so many complications. We already talked about quite a few of them, right? Decreased cardiac output, fluid volume overload, you're at risk for arrhythmias, you're at risk for pulmonary edema. So things they need to report immediately, right? A frothy sputum, a cough that won't stop, especially if it's moist, um, chest pain, any changes in rhythm when they're checking their pulse at home. All those need to be reported immediately because of the potential for complications that can occur. So let's talk about patient education. So of course, based upon the medications we give them or they're, or, or, um, they're prescribed, their medication list they go home with, especially if they're on an ACE or ARB and a beta blocker, they need to be checking their pulse, rhythm, and blood pressure at home. And of course, they're educated on how they can get a radial pulse. Uh, if they've never seen a blood pressure device before, how to take it, making sure it's a good fit for their arm. Do not discontinue meds abruptly. That's extremely important when we are talking about meds such as these. They should never discontinue abruptly. We don't want to see rebound hypertension or, or other conditions exacerbated. Smoking cessation is essential. If your heart failure client smokes, you have to educate on smoking cessation. Again, when it, the healthcare provider says it's safe to do so, they should be increasing their activity gradually and um, going towards a goal of healthy weight, right? And dietary recommendations. Um, 
confirm this is um you'll learn when you get to bedside nursing that heart failure actually falls into a core measure and there's certain things you have to document as a nurse that you do before a discharge of heart failure client and these are a couple of those things confirm initial follow-up appointments verify that they understand the meds that they're given make sure they have a copy of their med list those are all important things to do and then um, signs and symptoms of when to call the doctor. Before that, I noticed I skipped daily weights. Your client will have to take daily weights at home, just like they'll have to monitor their own pulse and blood pressure. But of course, what are we gonna educate them about? It needs to be the same scale at the same time. After you urinate or use the bathroom in the morning, before you eat breakfast in the morning in the same clothes. It has to be a structured way of taking their weight to make sure it's accurate. And then go based upon what your nursing book says or what your teacher tells you to write down, right? It can be anywhere from reporting weight two to three pounds daily, but um, two pounds per in one day is what should be reported or five pounds in one week. You can see some literature say three to five pounds in one week, but they need to be calling their healthcare provider if they see weight gain such as this. Again, supplement it based upon what your teacher says because they're testing you. And then, Signs and symptoms of when to call the doctor or 911. Again, going back to the complications that can occur. If they are extremely tired or dizzy, they need to be calling their doctor. If they are short of breath or having difficulty breathing, they need to call 911. Chest pain, call 911. There's a lot of complications that can occur, so you should be explaining those complications and notifying them of when to call the doctor. And sodium and fluid restricted diet if ordered. You can see, and again, this is really dependent on the severity, how well their, um, their disease is controlled, but if they have a sodium restricted diet, traditionally you see it restricted to two grams or less per day. And if they have a fluid restricted diet, again, um, it could be anywhere from 1.5 to two liters per day. Very severe restrictions might be like 1200 mLs per day. But when it comes down to these things, it's so important about education, sodium alone. If it says sodium, like salt free, there's still a little salt in there. If it says low sodium on the label, there's still sodium in there. A big thing when it comes to dietary restrictions is teaching your patient how to read the label, making sure they understand how many servings are in each package, right? They just jump straight to the sodium in milligrams. They're like, oh, this isn't much but then you have four servings in that package, that serving has now quadrupled. So making sure they know how to read labels. When it comes to fluid restriction, even ice. I used to, my, my patients on fluid restrictions in the hospital, they always wanted ice. That's counted in your fluid restrictions. So really making sure they understand what all is in fluid, ice counts, making sure they know how to restrict it. I always, would always get them little medicine cups so they know this is 30 mLs, right? So on average, you can have this amount per hour, really making sure they understand how to count and monitor and add up their fluids correctly if they're on a fluid restricted um, regimen per the healthcare provider. So I hope this helps y'all. Again, really understand the why, don't just memorize. Um, and if you missed heart failure part one, Go check it out on the page. And as always, if this helped you, help somebody else. We all are better together and we can't wait again. I know I say this all the time, but experienced nurses need y'all. Y'all take care.